the chat. And I'm excited to introduce the last speaker of today's symposium, Dr. Meng Meng Fu. She earned her Bachelor's of Science degree in biology with honors at Caltech and then moved on to pursue a PhD in neuroscience at University of Pennsylvania under the mentorship of Dr. Eric Holtzbauer. She then did her postdoctoral fellowship with Dr. Ben Barris at Stanford University, where she was awarded multiples of grants and fellowships, namely the National Multiple Sclerosis Society Postdoctoral Fellowship and the NRSA Fellowship. Um, she has actually started her own lab, her own research lab at NINDS NIH, with now a focus on microtubules and mRNA transport in oligodendrocytes, which she will discuss in today's presentation. Great, thanks, Dong Young. Um, I'm really excited, and thanks to you and Jingping for inviting me um, uh, to talk about my work as a postdoc. Um, as uh, Dong Young already told you, I just started my own lab here at NINDS, so I'm brand new. Just started uh, last month, and um, today I'll tell you more about um, building the oligodendrocyte and specifically how microtubules are formed in oligodendrocytes. Um, so we've already heard um, about some of the implications of um, oligodendrocytes in disease, as well as in development. And my focus is more on the very basic cell biology of how oligodendrocytes um, form their very elaborate ramified structures. So in this cartoon, um, what I've illustrated are some of the sources for microtubules in oligodendrocytes. Um, so more traditionally, uh, Centrosomes that are located near the cell body are a source of microtubules for oligodendrocytes. But for today's talk, I'll focus on these little stacks of uh, Golgi's that are called Golgi outposts. And so Golgi outposts are located along the ramified structures or the branches of oligodendrocytes. And they're also found along the microtubules that are inside the myelin sheath. So if you think of a um, oligodendrocyte like a little tree, um, it's making many branches, um, a big arbor of microtubule laden branches. And at the ends of those branches, instead of bearing fruit, they're making um, these long uh, myelin sheath structures that are very much like a long paper towel roll or a bolt of fabric. And if you unfurl um, that long paper towel roll, like uh, here in this cartoon, what you'll find are these lamellar microtubules or the uh, microtubules that are emanating from the outermost layer of that long paper towel roll all the way to the very inside of that paper towel roll that's juxtaposed with um, the axon. And so, of course, uh, microtubules are quite important for uh, oligodendrocyte function. Each cell can have up to 50 um, sheaths, depending on the cell type and the region in their brain. And these processes can extend greater than 100 to 200 microns in length. They're important for the transport of organelles and mRNA, and importantly for diseases of myelination, such as leukodystrophies um, in children, there are uh, mutations of tubulin genes that can lead to hypomyelinating disease. Okay, I think that my slide is not advancing, so, okay, great. Um, so what are microtubules? So structurally microtubules are composed of alpha and beta heterodimers that form a long protofilament and generally a 13 mer helix of these- um, Meng Meng, uh -huh. I'm sorry to interrupt. I think your slide got lost. Would you mind oh, sharing no. it again? Yes, let me do that. Here you go. Can you guys see that now? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. All right. Thank you. No problem. Thanks for letting me know. So uh, this hollow tube that's formed of the um, protofilaments then is the structure of the microtubule. And these structures are quite dynamic and they undergo phases of catastrophe and rescue or shrinking and growing. And uh, importantly in the cell, these are polarized structures that are known to have a minus N, which is thought to be more stable, and a plus N that's thought to be more dynamic. So uh, a lot less is known about the minus end of microtubules and a lot more is known about the plus end of microtubules. And so one of the first experiments that I did as a postdoc was to look at the plus end dynamics. And to do that, I used a uh, protein called uh, EB3 GFP to look at the polarity. And one of these movies looks like this. So this is a uh, cell that's been cultured from uh, primary cells and 
you can see these um, growing dots or um, comet tails. And the majority of them, if you look along any of these processes, are directed away from the cell body. So we can represent this type of motion um, in 2D with a chymograph. And a chymograph has time on the y-axis and distance away from the cell body on the x-axis. And therefore, any diagonal line going in this direction would be a microtubule that's growing away from the cell body. And a line in this uh, direction would be growing back toward the cell body. And quantifying across many different cultured time points um, and many cells, we see that these cells are consistently plus ends out, or in other words, the microtubules are consistently growing away from the cell body. So you might um, recognize from uh, this chymograph and in certain areas of uh, the movie that there are uh, certain areas along the process in which many microtubules are forming. So for example, along this point. And so I became interested in um, what could be causing um, these microtubules to be originating from specific sites. And so what is known about where microtubules come from or how they're nucleated to overcome the energy barrier to form microtubules uh, is that classically they form off of the centrosome, which is an organelle that's located near the nucleus. And uh, this structure uses a gamma tubulin dependent process along with the gamma tur complex of proteins to nucleate new microtubules. And you can see that illustrated really well in this fibroblast in which in green is um, uh, the microtubule uh, comp, uh, microtubules that are emanating from the centrosome. Now in more recent years, um, there has been more work focusing on acentrosomal microtubules or acentrosomal MTOCs or microtubule organizing centers that do not come from the centrosome. And some of these include uh, the nuclear envelope, Golgi and the cell body of migrating epithelial cells as well as um, Golgi outposts. So I'll tell you a little more about Golgi outposts. Um, in fly uh, dendrites, in work from the Jan and Jan lab, it's thought that in a special class of sensory neurons that do not have a centrosome, that they are the site of microtubule nucleation. Um, and this is very important for branching of the dendritic arbor. And this is a gamma tubulin dependent process. Um, and really nice work from the NIH, from Evelyn Ralston's lab in muscle cells, um, it has been uh, uncovered that Golgi outposts are also located at the um, grid intersections of microtubules in these cells. So in this image, you can see these horizontal and vertical uh, or longitudinal and transverse uh, microtubules uh, as they're called in that field. So those are shown in green. And in red, you can see um, Golgi outposts that are found um, at the intercalation of these sites. And this is the source of new microtubule growth um, in cells after they undergo depolymerization and then repolymerization. And importantly, at the time that I started um, to work on Golgi outposts and oligodendrocytes, there were no specific markers for this organelle, making any biochemical um, characterization of these organelles very difficult. And so probably I wouldn't have told you all of that if oligodendrocytes didn't have Golgi outposts. And what they look like um, in a 2D culture, so in a flat culture, um, is like this. So the uh, microtubules are shown in blue in this image and in uh, red and in white in the separate channel are um, the GM130 positive uh, Golgi outpost dots. So of course, uh, a lot of the labeling is in the cell body of the cell body Golgi, but these dot structures are the Golgi outposts. You can also look in vivo. Um, so this is a P14 mouse spinal cord, and uh, we can differentiate oligodendrocyte cell bodies by their large and speckled appearance. So in pseudo color, the cell is extending two processes, one emanating toward this um, uh, axon that looks like it's about to be myelinated and another um, toward this direction. And I'll zoom in on this region right here. So zooming in, um, we see that this um, Golgi outpost structure is a multi-layered structure. It's approximately one to two microns um, in dimension. And uh, it has many different um, small associated uh, structures that are likely um, cis, uh, medial, and trans stacks. So to 
very quickly recap what I've told you about oligodendrocyte um, microtubule organization. They're not like neurons at all. So they have a uniform microtubule polarity, which is quite like axons, um, but they also have uh, these Golgi outposts, which is like dendrites. Um, and so I hypothesized that um, they may have a unique mechanism for organizing microtubules that's unique for the cell type. And so to um, look at what proteins could contribute to this, um, I was aided by an RNA-seq database um, from the Barris lab, from Ye Zhang and Stephen Sloan. And I looked through that list to identify maps or microtubule associated proteins that are one, both highly and two, specifically expressed in oligodendrocytes. And so one of the um, genes that I became uh, interested in right away is called TPPP or tubulin polymerization promoting protein. So TPPP is a small 25 kilodalton protein with no predicted transmembrane domains. And by RNA-seq, it um, has very high expression in blue here in premyelinating oligodendrocytes and myelinating oligodendrocytes and very low to negligible expression levels in microglia, astrocytes, and neurons. And uh, so one of the first things that I did was, uh, of course, to knock it down, but then I also um, went about identifying and validating antibodies. And what TPPP staining looks like is it looks a lot like dots. So if we intercalate that with the previous image that I showed you of Golgi outposts, um, this is a really nice co-localization of these two markers of TPPP with GM130, which is the Golgi marker. And importantly, if you'll look to the cell body, um, GM130 labels Golgi in the cell body, whereas TPPP does not. So this is um, indicating that TPPP is uh, a marker for Golgi outposts and a specific one. So uh, about 93% of the TPPP positive structures are also GM130 positive. And so to come back to a very basic uh, molecular level to ask what is the function of TPPP, um, we asked this question of if it is able to nucleate or if it's sufficient to nucleate microtubules. And to do that, we looked at a cell-free um, biophysics assay. So this is um, work from my uh, collaborator, Suzanne Beckstead um, at McGill. And I was very fortunate to present this work um, at ASCB several years ago uh, where I met Suzanne and um, completely separate from us, Suzanne had performed a screen of recombinant maps uh, to identify novel uh, nucleators of microtubules. So one of the uh, robust nucleators that she identified is TPPP. So in this movie, that's only one minute long, um, you can see these asters um, with microtubules that are rapidly emerging from them. And so this is both a rapid and a robust process. And in this condition, we're using very low concentrations of GTP. So at one micromolar GTP in one minute, normally you would not see any microtubules formed. And so uh, knowing that TPPP is able to nucleate microtubules, uh, we then ask what um, is this uh, acentrosomal microtubule nucleation structure doing in oligodendrocytes. And so then I turn back to the oligodendrocyte culture system. And here I'm showing you um, endogenous uh, staining of tubulin uh, or microtubules. And what you can see um, of the wild type cell is that it has this very um, stereotyped ramification structure, whereas the TPPP knockout cells appear to be very disorganized uh, with many overlapping uh, branches. And if we quantify them using Scholl analysis, we can see that especially at, um, proximal areas that are near the cell body, that these TPPP knockout cells actually have a lot more branches um, than uh, uh, the wild type. And what we think that this is indicating is that um, the centrosomal population of microtubules that are being formed in the cell body are trying to compensate for uh, the more distal microtubules. And so this is why we see um, uh, increase uh, of branches near the cell body. Now, if we look at the microtubule dynamics. So again, here with EB3GFP, so the same um, marker that I showed you earlier, this is of a knockout cell. 
um, what you can see if you look along um, these branches is that you'll see a number of, and I'll just play it again, you'll see a number of um, dots that are now moving back toward the cell body. And so this is indicating that um, the microtubule polarity is now disorganized. We see about 50% of these microtubules are now directed back toward the cell body. So they're quite confused. And interestingly, if we then look in a 3D culture system, so now culturing these cells for two weeks, they now begin to make um, nascent myelin sheaths that are positive for MVP. And along these sheath structures, we also see GM130, so the Golgi outposts um, and uh, tubulin. Uh, so looking at these structures, um, we can then uh, ask what is happening along these lamellar microtubules. And so a prediction would be that um, if the microtubules uh, are defective in contacting axons, then we would expect to see fewer sheaths per cell. Um, so they're not ever reaching the axons, and so therefore we would not see a fully grown um, sheath structure. And uh, if then the uh, lamellar microtubules, so this class of microtubules is defective, then we would predict to see both shorter and thinner myelin sheaths. And that would be because um, the microtubules reach both um, from the outermost layer to the inside layer, as well as spanning the length of the microtubule. So when we look at um, these 3D structures with the TPPP knockout mouse oligodendrocytes, um, what we see is that these um, cells uh, have uh, sheath structures, but they appear to be much shorter. So quantifying many of these types of cells, um, we see that um, there is no difference in the number of sheaths per cell, indicating that there is no defect in the radial microtubules. And that would be consistent with the Scholl analysis, which um, indicates that there is actually conversely an increase of branches proximal to the cell body. However, the defect that we observe is a decrease in sheath length, and this is a decrease of about 50%. We can also um, orthogonally look in vivo, and in vivo we can look at P14 brains, um, thick sections, and uh, these images are max projections of uh, hundreds of Z stacks of individual cells. And so here's a wild type cell, for example, and you can see that it has these very long, beautiful myelin sheaths. And of the TPPP knockout cells, uh, these sheath structures are much shorter and um, we can quantify uh, many of these cells. And again, we see the same pattern that we saw in the 3D culture. So no change in the number of sheaths and a decrease of about 50% um, in the sheath length. So um, I mentioned that these cells are cultured from uh, TPVP knockout mice. So next we want to go to the level of the um, animals and ask um, whether a loss of TPVP also affects myelination in vivo. So staining the brains um, using MVP as a marker for myelin, we can see that um, the TPVP knockout cells um, have more um, diffuse and lighter staining with MVP. And especially if we focus on regions like the cortex and the hippocampus in comparison uh, to the uh, wild type mouse, and this is a, a three month old adult mouse, we can see that these animals um, have uh, very little MVP. And at three months, it does not seem um, that they're able to compensate um, for the lack of TPPP. You can also look by EM. So these are three month old optic nerves. And uh, quantifying uh, these structures, we see that um, there is, again, uh, increase in G ratio, which as I actually already explained to you, this is indicating that the myelin sheaths are now thinner in the TPPP knockout mice. Um, I should add that we see no difference in the percentage of axons that are myelinated. Um, but what we do see, uh, or uh, I think I took out that side. So what we do see is uh, some aberrant uh, structures where the axons have uh, large swellings that are filled with organelles. So um, in the time that I have um, remaining, um, I'll tell you sort of uh, how, about how these mice are sort of peculiar. Um, so we initially performed some rotor rod analyses uh, on them. And uh, we see that um, they have modest decreases 
in um, their uh, latency. So they are more prone to falling off the rotor rod. Um, however, in routine handling of the mice, one thing that we notice is that uh, they would exhibit um, aberrant freezing behavior whenever they were handled um, by, by people. And uh, so we were really interested in why they were displaying this behavior. And I was really uh, fortunate um, to uh, have a collaborator who's an expert in many different behavioral assays, and that's Hui Nguyen, who is a postdoc in Ting Ting Huang's lab at the Stanford VA. Uh, and we just recently published a paper in eNeuro describing some of these um, behavioral um, characteristics. So one of the assays that Hui did um, was the traditional fear conditioning assay. So this is a short-term fear conditioning assay in which uh, the mice are put into a training chamber on day one with an auditory cue. And then on day two of uh, context recall, um, they're put in the same chamber, but with no auditory cue. And on the third day, they're put in a different chamber, but with an auditory cue. So um, we can measure um, their recall of these um, separate um, stimuli of the chamber and also of the um, tone by looking at um, the day two freezing response. And here you can see that the TPPP knockout animals have a much reduced freezing response um, uh, in day two. And in day three, we see that um, they have, again, a much reduced freezing response um, when the tone is played back to them. So this is indicating that this memory dependent fear assay uh, at the TPPP uh, animals are really uh, defective at remembering um, the context in which um, they were shocked. We also performed a non-memory dependent fear assay and uh, we were down the hall from Andy Huberman's lab and um, they do a lot of these looming type um, fear assays um, to simulate uh, innate fear. So this is like, like an owl or uh, eagle coming to swoop down and eat the mice. And so um, should be a very evolutionarily conserved response. And uh, in the chambers, we're projecting a looming stimulus, a dark um, opaque uh, black circle that becomes increasingly larger and larger. And so um, if we look uh, at the wild type mice, they're largely uh, doing a lot of hiding after they see um, the stimulus and it's very quick. They do it generally within a couple of seconds. With the TPPV animals, um, they're still walking around. Many of them look quite curious and they have these arrows which are rearing responses and they are trying to get a better look at this object. So they're also um, quite defective in innate fear. Um, and it's not very clear to us mechanistically why they display this very particular behavior, but we did also look at different um, assays like um, uh, open field assays, um, and we did not see any differences in hyperactivity or uh, basal activity state in these animals. So this is indicating that it's a specific um, fear behavior. So um, coming back around to um, the Golgi outposts and what could be on the Golgi outposts, um, this is something that I'm interested in pursuing in my own lab. And um, part of this published work um, was to isolate Golgi outposts um, from whole brain. So we did a, a, a differential centrifugation. And at the end of that, we get a purified Golgi fraction. And from that Golgi fraction, we can then IP against TPPP to specifically isolate the Golgi outposts. So by EM, what these structures look like is this. So you can see these uh, gold beads that are um, conjugated to TPPP antibodies. And from those areas are microtubules that are emanating from these purified Golgi outposts and just zooming in so you can see the beads here. And when we do mass spec of these structures, um, we can identify about 118 enriched proteins as part of the Golgi outpost proteome. And uh, this is um, a short list of the top seven. And you can see that many of them are uh, transmembrane proteins. Um, some of them are well known. For example, LRP1 was recently shown by Roman Geiger's lab to be important for myelination in vivo. There are also proteins that um, yet do not have a name. So there are many interesting directions for us in the future as we try to um, address what the functions of these proteins could be. Um, so to you know, summarize um, what I've shown you about the TPPP story. Um, so TPPP is a 
Golgi outpost um, specific protein. And in unpublished data, we now believe that there is an alignment complex of maps that allows CPPP to mediate the um, uniform polarity. And therefore, based on that, if these alignment proteins are not associated with CPPP, this could allow the Golgi outpost to become uh, a nascent uh, branching site uh, for the formation of new microtubules, as without this yellow complex, microtubules would be able to nucleate at any given angle um, and therefore form new branches. So um, I wanna give a plug for myself, uh, let, let everyone know that I'm now hiring uh, new postdocs. And I wanna very quickly talk about um, what some of the um, uh, projects that um, we have are. So I told you about many of the different techniques that we use spanning both um, biophysics, biochemistry, cell biology, as well as um, neuroscience. And um, for the TPPP story, I'm very interested in how Golgi outposts may respond to extracellular cues. In addition, TPPP aggregates in an alpha synucleinopathy called MSA. So other synucleinopathies include Parkinson's disease. So I'm very interested in how the um, normal biophysical properties of TPPP as a protein can contribute to its likelihood to aggregate in this type of disease. In addition, to understand um, how the complexity of the microtubule organization um, uh, uh, happens in oligodendrocytes, um, I'm interested in different maps, tubulin modifications, and different tubulin isoforms in oligodendrocytes. In addition, um, uh, my ongoing interest, which is actually my primary project as a postdoc, uh, is on uh, mRNA transport in oligodendrocytes. And uh, there we've worked out that um, uh, this is a process that involves microtubule-based transport by uh, dynactin, dynein, and kinesin. Um, this work was published in PNAS several years ago, but there's also contribution from actin-based myosin motors. And then this is finally followed by um, local translation uh, of MBP, which is um, uh, the mRNA cargo that I study. And we now have three mouse models to study this process, a three prime UTR knockout and a myosin conditional knockout and knock-in that mimics a human disease. Um, and I'm also interested in, on a very biophysical level, how um, the structure of MVP3 prime UTR um, allows it to connect to these adapter proteins that then link it to the motor proteins. And we've also become quite interested based on unpublished data of other locally translated mRNAs. And uh, we believe that there are specialized um, ribosomes that are performing the function of um, local translation of these other uh, mRNAs and that tethering proteins may also be involved in those ribosome functions. So finally, um, here are my uh, acknowledgements. I've been really fortunate um, to work with um, many talented young people here at Stanford, as well as our collaborators, our funding sources. And I've been super fortunate to um, do my postdoc in a very nurturing environment. And I hope that for um, future trainees that I can provide that great environment for them as well. Thanks so much, and I'm happy to take questions. Great talk, Meng Meng. Um, so we have a number of questions in the chat. Okay. The first one is from Lucas T. Hi, great talk. Does TPPP co-localize with gamma tubulin? Did you try to overexpress TPPP? If so, what is the outcome? Yes, both excellent questions. So no, it does not um, co-localize with TPPP. Um, uh, Gamma tubulin, we looked by both um, staining and we looked by uh, mass spec of the purified Golgi outposts. And we did not see um, any uh, indication that gamma tubulins on the Golgi outposts. Um, uh, what was the second question? Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> Um, did you happen to overexpress TPPP? Yes, so we've, uh, if we overexpress TPPP, um, the cells will die like crazy. So it's very toxic. And this, I think, goes back to um, the aggregation in MSA. Um, we are doing a set of really interesting experiments now to um, uh, express TPPP um, in cell lines. And that is causing um, aberrant uh, MTOCs that are non-centrosomal. Next question is from Anna Maria. Uh, hi, great talk. Did you check the TPPP expression in any neurodegenerative diseases? And does the knockout mice show any impairment in the remyelination? 
we that's a great question we've not looked at remyelination that's something that um, i'm interested in i just wrote up my animal protocol and i put cooper zone in there so <laughs> that's ready for someone to come and work on that's really exciting um so i have another question from the chat how do you relate structurally and functionally more branching with less myelin sheath yes so let me go back to that so we um, do not see fewer myelin sheaths. So we see thinner and shorter myelin sheaths. So if I go back to this cartoon, so we believe that the defect we see is not in these radial microtubules, because as I showed you in the Scholl analysis, there are actually more um, microtubules that are near the cell body. So we believe that um, the, uh, the compensation from centrosomal microtubules is um, leading to no in vivo defects in radial microtubules. The defect that we see are in the very distal microtubules, which are the lamellar microtubules that are found along the myelin sheath. And that's why we do not see any differences in the number of myelinated axons. But what we do see is that the myelin sheaths that are there are thinner and shorter. Um, another question from Ye Zhang. Uh, beautiful work and congratulations for your new position. And then, um, are Golgi outposts uh, polar polarized away from the cell body and uh, is T TPPP involved in the polarization? Yeah, a great question. Yeah, hi. Um, so uh, Ye uh, has asked me this since I began working on uh, oligodendrocyte uh, Golgi outposts. And um, Based on the EMs, so our EMs, so if I um, rewind, um, so these structures, they look like they're in parallel to um, the process. And this is actually consistent with what has been observed by um, Mike Eller's lab in pyramidal neurons. Um, and uh, therefore, we think that the polarity is not coming from um, the orientation of the cis medial and trans stacks. And so um, that's why in the cartoon that I proposed here at the very end, um, we believe that there is a, a separate complex, this yellow complex of maps. Um, so these are alignment maps that can um, uh, bind to um, microtubules and um, allow them to align either in parallel or in anti-parallel. And so I think it's this association that gives the uniform polarity that we observe in the normal cells. Great question. I guess last question of the day from it is from Zhu Gang He. Is TPPP expressed in Shuan cells? Hi, Zhu Gang. Yes, TPPP is expressed, um, but very, very low. Um, so we don't see a ton of TPPP. Um, uh, I think uh, we have a Schwann cell RNA-seq database that's circulated within our lab in Ben's lab. Um, and uh, I think TPPP increases in the um, injury state, but its basal level is quite low. All right, um, so we encourage you to check the chat box for links to sign up for the email list uh, to tune in for future events. And if there's no further questions, Don and I would like to thank all the speakers and all of you for your time and participation. In the future, uh, we will continue this thing to talk about our favorite cell types, so oligodendrocytes. <laughs> and so if you're um, like, uh, you have paper to recommend or anything wanted to be uh, host or co-host, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And um, so have a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. And see you, hope to see you all soon. Bye-bye.